She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate everybody welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another coffee and crime time so sometimes when i'm getting ready to do a coffee and crime time i sort of feel like this dark cloud settle over me um i'm not sure why but you know talking about crimes that happened 20 years ago or you know even a decade ago even like 5 6 years ago they are a lot easier emotionally than talking about current crimes. Uh, maybe because so much time has passed, it seems further away. But when I start scrolling through current news, looking for a newer or ongoing case, it really just sucks because it's a reminder of how many terrible things are happening around the world every single day. And it affects me in my own personal life, especially when I see the number of children who are being harmed and who are losing their lives day after day, usually at the hands of someone they trusted, someone who they depended on to care for them and to love them. So when I'm looking at these cases all day and then I walk out of my office at night and I get to wrap my arms around my own children who are happy and healthy and loved, I should feel joy and gratitude, and I do, but I also feel guilt. I feel guilt that I am happy when there are so many people who are hurting. I feel guilt that my children are safe and protected when there are so many children who are not. Um, it may be irrational, it may be unproductive, but I do feel that way, and it breaks me sometimes. However, I still feel it is important to talk about these cases, to tell you the names of these children, to show you their pictures, to tell you their story. And I'm sure that it's as hard for you as it is for me. And I understand the aversion that some people have to watching videos that discuss cases of children. But at the same time, these children were important. They deserve to be talked about. And hopefully the lessons that can be learned from what happened to them can possibly save someone else. Today, we're talking about two-year-old Ezekiel Harry, who was last seen alive by neighbors on July 8th, 2022, and whose body was found in a trash can four days later. Um, but before we get into this case, before, before I lose my cool, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, HelloFresh. So I remember when I first started using HelloFresh in early 2020, when the pandemic hit, we were all locked away and there wasn't food on the shelves of the grocery store. Even if you were brave enough to leave your house, good luck finding anything that you could put together. And during that time, HelloFresh felt like a parachute, a way to feed my family if the worst happened. But HelloFresh has become so much more to me and I still use it to this day because it not only provided relief from my anxiety during those very stressful times, but it's really good. With HelloFresh, you can get mouth-watering seasonal recipes and fresh pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. And let's pause here for a moment because I said two things that are really important to me. Fresh pre-measured ingredients. I've been guilty of going to the store, buying way too much, spending way too much money to make one recipe. If the recipe calls for one cup of sour cream, I have to buy the whole container and then it goes bad. Or if it calls for half a cup of heavy cream, I'm buying the whole carton, and then it goes bad. Because like, what are we using heavy cream for on a day-to-day -day basis? I hate wasting food, and I hate wasting money, but HelloFresh sends you exactly what you need for each recipe, helping you cut down on your food waste by 25% compared to grocery shopping. And because the produce is shipped to you from the people who are growing it, it's not sitting on a grocery store shelf waiting for you to come by and pick it up, they're always at peak freshness level. I've never made a meal with HelloFresh that I didn't really enjoy, and their newest menu releases include Mediterranean recipes that are filled with 
with fresh fruits and veggies, nuts, olive oils, and fiber-packed whole grains. And you don't have to be some Michelin star chef to create these masterpieces because HelloFresh sends you cards, recipe cards, with each recipe, and they give you step-by-step instructions with pictures, so it's pretty much impossible to mess up, and you can really just relax and have fun cooking. They are so easy. I like to get my kids involved. We all have a really good time cooking together, getting our faces out of our computers and tablets, and just talking and being goofy and being together. HelloFresh really knows how to diversify your dinner menu with seasonal recipes like sweet heat shrimp tempura bowls, garden spinach ricotta ravioli, and one-pot creamy lemon dill chicken soup. And you can customize your favorite dishes with HelloFresh's new Hello Custom offerings. By swapping out one protein or a side for another, you can add a protein to a veggie meal, or you can upgrade for a more luxe experience. You can also add more protein if you're going to have a guest or like family over for dinner. You can skip a shipment if you're going to be out of town. It's all about what you want and need and what works for you. You'll find yourself eating out less, thus saving money, because using HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than dining out at a restaurant and just as good. Better, sometimes, in my opinion. You'll find yourself calling DoorDash less because HelloFresh is so easy and fun and your dinner ends up being much more healthy and delicious. With HelloFresh, you save money, you cut down on your stress because you don't have to plan meals or make trips to the grocery store, and you're being kinder to the planet since HelloFresh is the first carbon-neutral meal kit company and nearly all of their packaging is recyclable. Their streamlined supply chain reduces greenhouse gas emissions compared to grocery shopping, and they are in partnership with Plastic Bank. Through that partnership, HelloFresh prevents 10 million bottles from entering the ocean every year. So if you think all of this sounds great, you should check out HelloFresh for yourself. Right now, if you go to HelloFresh.com and use my code StephanieHarlow16, you'll get 16 free meals plus three surprise gifts and free shipping. Once again, go to HelloFresh.com and use my code StephanieHarlow16 to get 16 free meals three surprise gifts, and free shipping. And there's a knee on the end of Stephanie and Harlow. Thank you so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video, and let's get back to it. Ezekiel Harry was a two-year-old little boy who lived with his mother, 28-year-old Maya Jones, his mother's boyfriend, 36-year-old Jermaine Robinson, and his three siblings who ranged in ages between 5 and 10 years old. They had been renting a small, one-story house at 145 Cadre Street in Houma, Louisiana for about two months when Maya Jones called the police on Tuesday, July 12th, claiming that her son Ezekiel had been abducted. Maya told the police that she had been walking along Bayou Terrebon with her four children. The three older children were walking, and she was carrying two-year-old Ezekiel in an infant carrier. She said she had set the carrier down for a moment to tend to the other children when a man in a gray pickup truck drove up, grabbed Ezekiel, and sped away. Maya and her three remaining children ran to the residents in the area, and she urgently told them what had happened so that she could call law enforcement, which she did around noon. Police arrived and began searching for Ezekiel, and for a reference, this is an area with a lot of water. Terrebonne Parish is located just 55 miles from New Orleans, and it has 987 square miles of land, but over 1,000 square miles of water. So a lot of the searches were initially concentrated on these areas of water. And police asked the public to be on the lookout for little Ezekiel, who was reported to have last been seen wearing burgundy shorts and a white and blue striped shirt with an orange dinosaur on it. Law enforcement began searching areas of Bayou Terrebonne as well as the intercoastal waterway. They flew helicopters overhead. They had dozens of police officers combing the banks. But right from the start... Something was not adding up about Maya Jones's story. A neighbor had seen Maya walking with her three children and an infant carrier. But this neighbor had felt that the carrier was empty. It didn't look like there was a child inside. The police collected surveillance footage from the area that Maya had claimed her child had been taken from, as well as surveillance footage from the area where she lived with her children and her boyfriend. And they quickly discovered that they too believed the infant carrier was empty when she had left the house, and they'd seen something else in those surveillance tapes that was beyond disturbing. 
On the morning that Ezekiel was reported missing, Maya Jones and her boyfriend, Jermaine Robinson, were seen leaving their home with a black duffel bag. They returned home hours later without that duffel bag. Here is Homa Police Chief Dana Coleman. Um, through investigation, we learned that her accounts that she was reporting to us was false. Um, immediately, we suspected foul play. With her being in the area of the canal, we thought she may have disposed the kid in the uh, Bayou Terrebonne or the Intercoastal Waterway. So we was assisted by the Terrebonne Parish Sheriff's Office. We deployed our special operations into the waterway as well in efforts to uh, find the two-year-old. Um, as this was taking place, um, she was interviewed by several of our experienced investigators, um, which um, after several hours, she began directing them to the area of Dasper Street, which is two streets over from our police department, where we located the remains of Ezekiel uh, Harry. With us ga gathering video surveillance, <clears throat> we saw um, the mom, which is uh, Maya Jones, walking with what appeared to be a infant carrier, a dark colored infant carrier. She was followed by three other small children. Um, at that point, in the initial phases of the investigation, we thought she had the kid with her. But um, as the investigation continued and we discovered little Ezekiel on Dasper Street, now we believe that when she was carrying that carrier, it was in, in fact empty. So it appears that after several hours of questioning and several hours of giving police false information, Maya Jones finally told law enforcement where they could find her son. At 6 p.m. that same day, Ezekiel's body was recovered from a garbage can on Daspit Street, which was just two streets away from Homa Police headquarters. The garbage can actually belonged to a residential address, and the woman who owned it remembered police arriving at the scene. But it was just a block away from the police department where he was found. Here on Daspit Street, neighbors say police showed up out of nowhere, and the homeowner of the property where Ezekiel's body was found in the trash can says she's shocked. I was in my house laying down in my bed and I sound like I heard the like a woo-woo, you know, uh, so I told my, I called my 10 year old and I told her, sound like I hear the police outside go see or whatever. She said, yeah, mama, they taping off around the house. So I came outside to see and I seen a lady laying down on the ground beside the trash can. Uh, and then after that, they told me that, you know, to go back in my house. Like, I thought the lady was dead or whatever, but after they came to explain that the lady said her baby was abducted or whatever, then after they interrogated her, she, you know, told what happened and, you know, brought him to the trash can, which was in front of my house. What goes through your mind knowing that happened right outside your doorstep? I got babies myself, you know, so, like, it was scary or whatever. But you never saw her do it? No. So from that clip, it actually looks like Maya Jones, Ezekiel's mother, she accompanied police to the garbage can. And then she laid down on the street next to it in what I would assume to be grief of some kind. Maya Jones and her boyfriend, Jermaine Robinson, were promptly arrested. They were charged with first-degree murder, obstruction of justice, and evidence tampering. And after an autopsy, it was discovered that Ezekiel had died from blunt force trauma to the head, and there were also signs on his body that he had been abused long term. Maya's other three children were placed in the custody of their father, Trey Harry, and their grandmother, Cynthia Harry. So there's actually a lot to unpack here. And I feel like this has just become an exhausting, ridiculous pattern that we see repeated every time a young child is killed or harmed at the hands of family members. Without fail, it goes like this. Neighbors, friends, family members, they come out of the woodwork and they say, yeah, there was always fighting going on over there. Yeah, we suspected something wasn't right. Yeah, those kids didn't look like they were being cared for. Yeah, we called the police. They did nothing. Then the police come out and they say, well, we did all we could. We did what we were allowed to do within the bounds of the law, within the bounds of our responsibilities. And then every single time the local Department of Children and Family Services or the local Child Protective Services is contacted for a comment, and they ain't got one because, you know, they have to protect the integrity of the investigation or the privacy of the child. I'd like to tell you that this case was different. I'd like to tell you that someone took responsibility. Someone said, hey, you know, in hindsight, we could have done more. We should have done more. 
And that applies to everyone. That applies to neighbors, community members, law enforcement, CPS, family members, teachers, etc. But no, we just play the blame game, the shift responsibility anywhere and everywhere as long as it's not on me game. And I mean, I'm not saying that there were not people involved here who probably did or tried to do whatever they could, because I'm sure there were. But from what I can see, it's really just a lot of the same. There's an old African proverb, it takes a whole village to raise a child. (laughs) Now imagine my surprise when I Googled this and I found out that somehow this quote has become now attached to Hillary Clinton. Somehow, like she's getting credit for having said it, for, for some odd, bizarre reason that I literally can't explain to you besides the fact that people just no longer read or are interested in history. I mean, maybe it's because she wrote a book called It Takes a Village. And in this book, Hillary Clinton also said that to have a child is to decide forever to have your heart go walking around outside your body. Also another quote that she did not come up with on her own. Um, this This is not something that Hillary Clinton came up with. She did not invent It Takes a Village. But, you know, for some reason now we think she did. But regardless, uh, both statements are true. Both of these quotes that she stole are true. And what does that mean? You know, what do we mean by it takes a village? Well, it means, you know, as parents, we love our children and we want to do the best thing for them and give them all the best opportunities. But we are also only one or two people and we face different challenges and adversities in life. And we encounter our own sets of personal problems, whether they be emotional or physical. And these problems can sometimes detract from our ability to give everything or even a lot to another human being, even though we may still want to. So we need to be able to depend on our communities, our extended family, to step in and bear the weight when we cannot. Therefore, making sure that the most important person in the equation, which is the innocent child, they don't go without what they need. And in this situation, it also means that sometimes some people are just not meant to be parents, or maybe they did have the potential to be good parents at some point, but something got in the way, whether it be a drug or alcohol addiction or a mental illness or, you know, who knows. I know oftentimes people get a little agitated or annoyed because I'm blaming the police or I'm blaming CPS or I'm blaming the neighbors or I'm blaming, you know, everybody but the parents. And that's just definitely not the case. I, of course, blame the parents. But when somebody's just not a good parent, what do you do? Just say, ah, well, it's the parents' responsibility to take care of the kid and they're not a good parent. So good luck, kid. No, you have to step in as a community and as, you know, concerned citizens to help where you can. And when the main caregiver, the main parent, isn't doing a good job, that's when the community, with concern for the well-being of a child who didn't get to choose who they were born to, steps in and keeps an eye out, right? Neighbors should be listening and watching for red flags, such as constant chaos at the home, fighting, domestic violence, etc. Teachers should be reporting if a child comes into school, malnourished, uncared for, or with signs of abuse, whether those signs are physical or emotional. It truly does take a village, especially when the parents of a child are garbage people. And Ezekiel's village they were noticing things. Reportedly, Ezekiel's father, Trey, was trying to get full custody of his children because he was concerned about the kids being with their mother. He said, quote, I've been fighting to get them from her because of our past and what I dealt with from her, like whipping them for the smallest thing, but it was like a big whipping, end quote. I don't know if he means actual whipping, like, um, with a, an instrument or whipping, like, you know, just spanking them or, or hitting them with her hand. I'm not sure what he means in that context. I should desperately hope that she wasn't actually whipping her children with some sort of instrument because at that point <laughs> the police should have been called, Child Protective Services should have stepped in, and Trey should have gotten full custody, right? Like, at the very least, temporary full custody while an investigation happens. But once again, I'm not sure exactly what he means by that or how long that kind of behavior was going on on behalf of Maya Jones. It also appears that several neighbors were concerned about the safety of the children, and some even called the police, with one person also making an anonymous complaint to the Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services. Nevea Fonseca, who lived next door to Ezekiel, said that her mother considered calling the police due to the many arguments that were always happening at the house. But instead, 
It looks like Nevea's mother chose to respect the couple's privacy. Nevea said, quote, People normally argue that's their business. Me and my boyfriend argue all the time. If we were arguing, we wouldn't want people calling the cops on us, end quote. Well, first of all, there's a lot wrong with that statement. Um, least importantly of all, people don't want to hear you and your boyfriend arguing all the time, right? People don't want to be in the privacy of their own homes and have to be subjected repeatedly to loud verbal arguments from other houses. But more than that, I really can't stand this normalization of dysfunction. People argue all the time, right? I mean, I, I suppose that's true. People do argue all the time, but it's toxic, right? It's not the sign of a healthy relationship. It's the sign of a relationship you should probably move on from. One that may only be verbally aggressive now, but could escalate at any time. Having disagreements in a relationship is normal, of course. You know, like not agreeing with your spouse or your partner is completely normal. You're two different people with two different life experiences, two different sets of morals and values. You are raised differently. But having constant yelling matches that can be heard by neighbors, that's not normal. Please, can we stop pretending it is, right? Please, can we stop pretending that constantly screaming at your spouse or your boyfriend or your partner so loud that other people can hear you is normal? And nobody should be concerned about that and nobody should call the police. And if someone calls the police because they hear you and your spouse or partner constantly arguing, it's probably because they're concerned that someone could get hurt, which is a valid concern. I told this story before. I used to live in an apartment and the walls, man, I don't know if they were that thin because I didn't hear any other neighbors. But my one neighbor, I'd be hearing all the time. They are always fighting. They're always screaming. Well, he's always screaming at her. The kids are always crying. I called the police all the time. They hated me. They hated me. But I was concerned, right? It, it was also disruptive, you know, because my own kids are like terrified now because they constantly hear these kids on the other end of the wall crying. And these were little kids, like three, four, five years old. So my kids are constantly hearing these kids crying. I'm constantly hearing the kids crying. I stepped in. I'll tell you a little bit more um, at the end. But I stepped in because the police didn't do anything. Another neighbor of Ezekiel's, Sarah Plaisance, also heard the arguing coming from Maya Jones's house. And she took it a lot more seriously, which... I believe is the accurate response. Sarah said, quote, You can hear it inside my house to the point where I had to move my daughter out of her room. Her room is in the upstairs corner of my house, and it was so bad that she couldn't sleep at night. End quote. And Sarah, she doesn't even live directly next door to Ezekiel. She lived across the street. Sarah said that she could hear the kids crying, Maya screaming, and she said that she was afraid that Jermaine was hurting them. And it got so bad that Sarah herself would start crying and shaking, which sometimes is a response. Like if you hear loud screaming and you've come from a place of abuse in your childhood or a previous relationship, when you hear those things again, you can have this very um, – real physical response. Sarah also said that she called the police several times, but quote, nothing was ever done. They left. And for the past two weeks, it's been a little quieter around the house. I thought things were getting better, but I guess they were just keeping things quiet, end quote. Neighbors also said that the last time they'd seen little Ezekiel was on July 8th when he was outside playing in the driveway. However, seeing Ezekiel outside was rare since the neighbors hardly ever saw any of the four children outside of the house, which is another red flag, okay? You have a house with four children in it. They never go outside to play. Four children, and they're not outside playing? Another neighbor, uh, Peter Petra, he claims that he met Jermaine Robinson once and Jermaine seemed nice. Peter said that he was outside and Jermaine asked him for a cigarette. So Peter gave him a cigarette, they fist bumped, and then parted ways. Peter said, quote, he did come talk to me for a second about a cigarette. I thought he was cool as hell, end quote. How in the world can you decide someone is cool as hell when you have literally only had in Peter's own words, a second of interaction with them. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm being an asshole. I feel like I'm being a judgmental asshole, but come on, Peter. And Peter knew 
that there was something going on at that house because three weeks prior to Ezekiel's death, the police had questioned him about a reported dispute at a house, like in his neighborhood, on his street, but they didn't give him the address. But then the next day, he saw police at Maya's house. And as it turns out, Jermaine Robinson was not cool as hell. Shocker. I know, right? Dude asked me for a cigarette and, like, gave me a wicked fist bump. He's cool as hell. Ugh. Fox 8 reported that Jermaine Robinson has a lengthy criminal history. In LaForche Parish, Robinson faced a 2017 charge for distribution of drugs and a 2009 cruelty to a juvenile charge. He pled guilty to both charges and he was sentenced to serve five months for the cruelty charge and 11 days for the drug charge. In Terrebonne Parish, Jermaine Robinson was arrested for a hit and run in 2005, which he pled guilty to the following year, and he faced felony charges for armed robbery in 2016, which he accepted a plea deal for, reducing that charge to simple robbery, and he was sentenced to nine months with time served. So yeah, just an overall cool as hell person, I think. We've got drug charges, you know, whatever, people make mistakes. We also have that cruelty to a juvenile charge, which is the intentional or criminally negligent mistreatment or neglect by anyone 17 years or older of any child under the age of 17, whereby unjustifiable pain or suffering is caused to said child. So basically, it's child abuse. Did Maya Jones know that her boyfriend, Jermaine, had already served time behind bars for abusing children? I don't know. But I mean, I would expect that his criminal record had come up in conversation at some point during their relationship, which is the smart thing to do if you're going to bring some strange man into your house where your four small children live. Ezekiel's grandmother, Cynthia Harry, she said that she had never met Jermaine. But when the three remaining children were placed in her custody after the arrest of their mother, she said, quote, when they came to me, the girls, the older one, came to me and she was like, mama, she said, we missed you so much. We couldn't talk to you or reach out to you. I don't have a phone no more, she said. She was like, Jeremiah be beating us and he whip us hard. And even the neighbors was saying that they're hearing a lot of crying over there next door to them, end quote. I don't really see the kids a lot. They keep the kids inside most of the time. Sarah Plaisance lives at this house. As you can see, it's just across the way from where little Ezekiel lived. She says sometimes the yelling was so aggressive, she feared for the safety of the children in that house. I called the cops crying. I was shaking and I said, please send somebody out here. He's going to kill somebody in this house. Sarah says Ezekiel's family moved in after Hurricane Ida. The yelling she heard between two adults began two and a half months ago, worsening three weeks ago. I could just hear the kids screaming and crying inside that house and what else, what else can I do? Sitting together 24 hours later, Sierra is asking why no one stepped in before tragedy struck. Why was nothing done? Why didn't they do more? I, more needs to be done. So since Ezekiel's death, since his body was found, police have come under fire from the community and on social media for not taking the complaints and reports from neighbors more seriously. Police Chief Dana Coleman reported that there were three law enforcement responses to the address during the short time Maya and Jermaine had lived at 145 Cadre Street. One time, police were there in response to a loud dispute, and the other two times, they were there in response to welfare checks requested by a relative. He said that during all three of these occasions, no criminal behavior was observed by responding officers. And he also sort of suggested that many people who had been claiming they had called and made complaints were not being completely truthful. He said, quote, in the beginning, we were asking if any of our people were familiar with this address. We started doing our research and quickly developed that some of this we were being accused of is inaccurate. When people make comments and we quickly determine that they are inaccurate, honestly, it's like taking a punch in the gut. We are here to provide a service and I think our law enforcement provide an excellent service, end quote. I mean, I would argue that the police are meant to protect and serve. You know, this isn't a case of ordering a coffee at Starbucks and getting the wrong drink. Yes, you do provide a service, but your service is to protect. So if you did not protect, then you aren't actually providing an excellent service. You may be trying your best within the limitations of the law, 
but let's not give you a five-star review on Yelp just yet. And this is what bugs me. Like, nobody can say, man, we messed up, or man, we should have done more, or I wish we could have done more. It's like, we're doing a great job. And to have people criticizing us, it's like really hurtful. Well, (laughs) how do you think Ezekiel feels? How do you think his father feels? How do you think Ezekiel's three older siblings feel now that he's gone? You know, if you're talking about a punch to the gut, I think that, you know, maybe they have a little bit more reason to feel a punch to the gut. Chief Coleman went on to say, quote, I understand the concerns people have, but we can't simply force our way into someone's house because there has been an argument or if there's no evidence of a crime being committed, end quote. And I do understand that. Like I said, I understand that police are limited in what they can do. However, I have been in situations where two people are in a heated argument, they're yelling, throwing things, the neighbors call the police, the police show up. They don't need to force their way into the house. They can just ask, like, hey, can we go in and look around? Or, hey, can we go in and talk about this so we're not standing out in the front yard and, you know, your neighbors aren't watching? And if you're having more than one report of the same type of complaint to the same address, that is grounds to investigate further, I believe. When the police responded to this home, did they even go inside? Did they ask to go inside? If they had, they may have been able to see the kids, see the environment that these kids were living in. Were these kids being cared for? Was it a clean and safe home? Were there drugs or weapons or things laying around? And then that gives you an indication of whether or not something else needs to be done. If you aren't going to do anything but ask the two people involved in the heated argument if everything is okay, then why bother showing up at all? At that point, you know, it's just demonstrative theater. It's just to say you did something, to be able to write your report and close the book on it. But Police Chief Coleman did make a good point. He said that oftentimes these reports are called in by people who prefer to remain anonymous because obviously no one wants to seem like a nosy Nelly. They don't want to call the cops on their neighbors. And then when the cops leave, they still have to live on the same street as these people. You know, awkward. Chief Coleman said that this anonymity, it stalls any potential investigation because the police have no way to follow up with the person who made the report or reports. The police have no way of getting further information in order to have a better understanding of what the person heard or saw or how frequent this type of behavior was. Scott Koreji, a police consultant and trainer from Baton Rouge, he claims that anonymous information is almost never actionable without further cooperation. He said, quote, If an anonymous complaint says there is a dead body at 123 Main Street, we can never get a warrant or take action without some physical evidence or supporting evidence. Police can effectively do nothing except go to an area and try to observe cooperating information or evidence, end quote. But how are they observing anything, like if they don't go inside? Again, you know, they can knock on the door, they can ask to go inside, the people who live there can say no, but you could ask. And I will say, I think what Scott is saying here is a bit of a blanket generalization because law enforcement has been known to send in SWAT teams guns blazing if they think there's like an active shooter or someone's currently being held hostage, someone's in current danger. And they've been known to do this based only on a phone call, sometimes an anonymous phone call, usually an anonymous phone call. It actually has happened so frequently that there's a term for it now. They call it swatting. According to Cloudflare.com, quote, swatting refers to a harassment technique most often perpetrated by members of online communities. Swatting entails generating an emergency law enforcement response against a target victim under false pretenses. Swatters do this by making phone calls to emergency lines like 911 and falsely reporting a violent emergency situation. Swatters often consider what they're doing to be a prank, but it can come with serious consequences, end quote. Yeah, like a SWAT team busting into someone's house, right? This has even happened when streamers were live on the internet. And I'm not saying that this is the response that should happen. Obviously, it shouldn't. But you might argue that children in abusive households are being held hostage and they are in danger. So for those kinds of situations where law enforcement gets a call that someone's being held hostage, they send in the SWAT team. But for a potentially and repeatedly abused child, they need some kind of physical proof before throwing their weight around? Well, I mean, if you need physical proof, you have it now in the form of the dead body of Ezekiel Harry and thousands and thousands of children like him. And listen, I don't have the perfect answer. Um, I see it from both sides. As a parent, I can absolutely understand not wanting the law to get involved with my family. 
And I can also understand that people might make fake claims of child abuse just to harass me and my family or just because maybe, you know, Jane down the street has a problem with Susie down the street because maybe Susie looked at Jane's husband or maybe Susie hasn't been going to church enough or maybe Susie wears those yoga pants too much and Jane thinks it's inappropriate. So Jane calls in a false report of child abuse. And we can't be sending in the SWAT team every time Jane's got too much time on her hands because then we'd be doing that every day. So I get it. I get that that there's no perfect system. I get that there's a lot of shades of gray. But if it means that there is a policy where multiple reports of abuse from multiple different sources means that maybe my child gets removed from my home for a day or two while there's an investigation, I would accept that because, first of all, I know I'm not abusing my children, so I have nothing to fear. Um, You know, they're going to figure that out pretty quickly. There's no physical signs of abuse. But at least it would mean that these children would have a chance that maybe the child being abused could say, oh, I'm out now. I have a chance to say what's happening to me. Or maybe the child's siblings would say, yeah, you know, Ezekiel's too young, but we've definitely seen him get hit. Our mom, our stepdad, whatever, has definitely been abusing him. Things like that. I don't know. It's... (laughs) It's hard. I mean, if there was an easy way to fix this, I'm sure it would be done already because I can't imagine that anybody, whether it be the police or neighbors or, you know, child protective services, I can't imagine that anybody is sitting here like we don't care if kids are getting abused. But it's it's a slippery slope. And as I did say, there were claims that people had called DCF reporting that they were worried about the safety of the children in that house. So as always, DCF was contacted to verify whether these complaints had actually been made. And as always, they were completely unhelpful. Spokesperson for the Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services, Sean Ellis, said, quote, DCFS cannot comment on or even acknowledge the existence of a potential investigation of abuse or neglect involving a child. If there is an investigation, state laws make the entire process from report to investigation to outcome confidential, end quote. I take my sweater off because I'm getting heated. And listen, um, I would, I suppose, understand that if there was an active investigation happening into the welfare of a living child, you would want to protect the privacy of that child and, you know, even that of the child's family because there's a chance the allegations aren't true. But right now we have a dead child whose name and face is all over the news and two adults whose names and faces are all over the news. So what exactly are we protecting here? It feels more like they don't want to admit they were aware of this family and the problems that existed because then they might be asked, why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you do something for this kid before he was beaten to death? And in my opinion, I have a feeling that DCFS was aware of what was going on and my feeling comes from this clip. I'm a mother, first of all. I'm also a social worker. Um, And I didn't personally know the family, but I knew of them. And it was such a tragedy in our community. So she said she was a social worker. She didn't personally know the family, but she knew of them. Was that because she knew of them through her job as a social worker with DCFS? And I'm not blaming this woman. Of course not. Individual social workers can only perform their duties within the confines that are placed on them by the state agency and government. But it's clear to me that to some extent, both law enforcement and DCFS were aware that these kids, Ezekiel and his siblings, were not in the best situation. And it seems like Louisiana has been struggling with an epidemic of deadly violence towards children for years, and it's not getting any better. A February 2021 article reported that the Louisiana child death rate from assault is 4.6 per 100,000, which is more than two times the national average of 2.1. The number of child victims of abuse and neglect increased by 32.3 percent between 2011 and 2015. And in 2015, the state reported 46,000 referrals for child abuse and neglect. 55 percent of those were referred for investigation. The American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry guidelines say that there should be 47 child and adolescent psychiatrists for every 100,000 children. And even that is only one per 2,000 children. But in Louisiana, they only have 7.7 of these mental health professionals for every 100,000 children, or one for every 12,987 children. One 
child mental health professional for every 13,000 children. So I'm just going to put this out there. It seems like the state probably needs more of these people, more social workers and more mental health professionals for children and adolescents. So what can Louisiana do to encourage this? Well, maybe they can create scholarships to pay for the education and training of people who are interested in going into this line of work with the requirement that these individuals stay in state once they've completed their degree. This will come from tax money, obviously, but it benefits the people of Louisiana who clearly and desperately need resources for children and families. And where is the tax money going now? Anyways, like if you live in Louisiana, where's your tax money going? From what I know about the state, It doesn't seem like a lot of it's going to help people, at least not the bulk of it. And I do understand that that there's some uniqueness about Louisiana. This is a state that's been devastated by hurricanes twice, uh, Katrina and Ida, uh, Ida most recently. And I think that, you know, probably a lot of money went to, you know, fixing all of the damage to the infrastructure that happened. That makes sense. But in this current year, 2022, it looks like Louisiana receives half of its revenue from the federal government. And that's more than any other state uh, besides Wyoming and Alaska. This article from TheAdvocate.com says, quote, It's not just grants to help recover from the pandemic and disasters. Louisiana has long received nearly half its money from the federal government to augment programs that help roughly 20 percent of the population living in poverty and the 50 percent of the state residents who struggle month to month because of low pay. And that's great. You know, if all of that money, which is something like I think 18 or 19 billion dollars that's coming from the federal government. If all that money is going to help people in poverty, which there's plenty of them in Louisiana, that's great. But is it is it going there? You know, I don't I don't know. You've got state senators making between 30 to 60 grand a year. And you may say, oh, that's reasonable, you know. Until you realize that being a state senator is a part-time job. They only work like 16% of the year. And that's not just a problem with Louisiana. Don't get me wrong. It's all over the United States. When you ask the internet, where does the tax money in Louisiana go? They tell you that it's generally spent on government salaries, infrastructure, education, public pensions, public assistance, corrections, Medicaid, and transportation. But a large chunk of that does go to government salaries, something around $2 billion. How did this happen? Like, when did these people go from being public servants to overpaid elites? Why are people in politics always wealthy? Why do they seem like they're the wealthiest among us? The amount of money that politicians get from being in politics, not just from their salaries, but from bonuses and speaking engagements and book deals, in my opinion, it attracts the wrong kind of person, the person who's in it for what they can achieve, not for what they can achieve for the people they are supposed to serve and represent. And if you could just say, I don't know, tell a state senator, like, you don't really work that much, dude, so we're going to cut your salary in half and we're going to take what we took from your salary and we're going to put it towards the people or we're going to put it towards programs so we can get more social workers, so we can get more mental health help for these children and adolescents of our state. Maybe if politicians, public servants, didn't get paid so much to be politicians and public servants, you would be getting the right kind of person who's doing it because they want to do it, because they care about their state, their country, the people in it, and they're doing it because they want to make a change, and that ends up being worth more to them in the long run than, you know, some money in their pocket or a better table at a restaurant because you're a senator. And you might be saying, like, Stephanie, why are you talking about this? Why are you ranting about this? How is this relevant? Of course it's relevant. Of course it is, right? There's people in power who are given the jobs to make the laws and make the decisions, and those people are responsible for doing those things, right? That's, that's their job. That's, that's their one job. So of course it's relevant. Because as I said, the murder of children in Louisiana has become a rampant pandemic. Over the course of four days in September of 2021, three children under the age of two died at the hands of their parents. Two-year-old Neve Allen was reported missing by her mother in Baton Rouge on Friday, September 28th. And during the course of an investigation, police found out that the small girl was not missing at all. She was dead. Her mother, Lainea Cardwell, had gotten angry when Neve had walked into the bathroom while she was getting ready for work and grabbed her contact lens case. So, Lainea Cardwell punched her daughter in the stomach with a closed fist. So hard, the two-year-old flew backwards and hit her head on a cabinet. 
Cardwell's boyfriend, Philip Gardner, then took Linnea to work and returned home with Neve, who was complaining of a stomach ache and refused to eat. At some point, the child lay down on the couch and became unresponsive, and so Gardner put Neve in a suitcase and disposed of her in a garbage can, not calling 911 and leaving his phone at home so he could not be tracked. A forensic pathologist stated that Neve had severe trauma, which had caused brain swelling, but he could also not rule out that she had been alive when she had been placed in the suitcase by her mother's boyfriend, causing her to suffocate to death prior to succumbing to her other injuries. So basically, like if Philip Gardner had taken Neve to a hospital to get her help, instead of putting her in a suitcase and throwing her away, she may have survived. She may have gotten the help she needed and survived. Four days before Neve was reported missing, 10-month-old Joshua Black and his 5-year-old brother were thrown from a bridge into Cross Lake in Shreveport by their mother, Eureka Black. Both children were recovered from the water, but little Joshua was pronounced dead at the scene while the 5-year-old was taken to the hospital for treatment. Their mother had left the scene and was later arrested across the state border at a rest stop in Texas. She was charged with one count of second-degree murder and one count of attempted second-degree murder. And on Tuesday, September 28th, police responded to a call from a family member of 11-month-old Zabria Gudry requesting a welfare check on the baby who was then with her father, Jake, in Thibodeau in LaForge Parish. When authorities arrived, Jake Gudry told them he had hit his daughter too hard and she had died, and police found the child in the rear cargo area of his SUV. Initially, Zebrea's mother, Kajiona Butler, had claimed to have had no knowledge of what had happened to her daughter, but she too was later arrested and charged with principal second-degree murder. In April of 2022, just a couple of months ago, four-year-old China Record died from acute alcohol poisoning after her grandmother and her mother had become angry when the toddler took a sip from a bottle of Canadian mint whiskey. Booking documents state that the two women then forced the toddler to consume the rest of the bottle, which was over half full. And her grandmother forced her to drink this bottle of alcohol while the four-year-old girl was on her knees. China became unresponsive. Of course, what did they think was going to happen? She was placed in a bathtub, and by the time police arrived, the four-year-old's blood alcohol level was 0 .680, eight times the legal limit for people over the age of 21 to drive. It was reported that the grandmother, Roxanne Record, was the one who forced China to drink the bottle, but China's mother, Kaja Record, was present, she watched it, and she did nothing to stop it. If there is a hell, I hope they both burn in it for all eternity on their knees. Canadian Mint is an 80-proof whiskey, okay? An 80-proof whiskey. Now, I don't know what size the bottle was. It could have been the smaller one, could have been the bigger one. But either way, if it's the smaller one, it costs 10 bucks. If it's the bigger one, it costs 20 bucks. So these two women tortured and murdered this four-year-old little girl over a at tops 20 bottle dollar of whiskey. It's absolutely disgusting. It's torture. Also, in April of 2022, five-year-old Summer Hawkins was rushed to the hospital when she became unresponsive at her Baton Rouge home. Her father, 23-year-old Aaron Hawkins, told police she had been hurt in a fall and she was pronounced dead at the hospital. But once at the hospital, medical staffing there noticed bruising and other marks on Summer's body, which suggested she had been abused for a while. A witness told investigators that Aaron was known to hit his daughter with a belt and someone had just intervened the week prior due to his excessive discipline. That's such bullshit. It's not discipline. I'm sick of hearing these watered down words used to describe horrendous acts. We don't say a woman was raped. She was sexually assaulted. We don't say a child was beaten to death. We say she was overly disciplined. Like this is gross. We don't have to sugarcoat this so it's not like hard for people to hear. It should be hard for people to hear. This isn't like Harry Potter, like, oh, he who should not be named. Like if you say the word, something bad's going to happen. Something bad already happened. And in March of 2022, nine people were arrested in connection with the alleged abuse and molestation of multiple children near the city center of Vidalia, Louisiana. An investigation began on February 28th after police received a report of a potentially inappropriate relationship between a teenage girl and a man in his 50s. 
Charges against these nine individuals suggested that three children in the home were victims of molestation. One child had multiple unexplained absences from school, and according to law enforcement, the house was the same location as an arrest made in 2021 involving child pornography charges. A search warrant was executed at the house on March 3rd, and authorities found this house to be unlivable, with a total of 13 people residing there, including one man who was a convicted sexual predator. An undisclosed amount of narcotics was also recovered from the address. These are just a handful of the multiple cases I came across from one quick Google search just from the past couple of years. There were so many, so many, I couldn't possibly tell them all to you. I just had to pick a few to tell you about. And in my opinion, this is a clear-cut sign of a society in decay and decline when we can't even care for the most vulnerable among us. For two-year-old Ezekiel, a vigil was set up around the garbage can where his body was found. Yolanda James, she's the woman who owns the, the house where the garbage can belongs to, she wishes someone would just take it away, and she hasn't touched it since Ezekiel was found there. She said, quote, he was robbed of his whole life, and me, when I look at that trash can, that's what I think about, end quote. Those who knew and loved Ezekiel called him Zeke. They said he was a feisty and lively boy who loved to dance, loved to go to church. He liked spending time with his family and playing with his siblings. His grandmother remembers the times that little Zeke would come into her house saying, quote, we had a great relationship. Every time he'd come to my house, I'd go into my room, he'd start banging on the door to come in. I'd have to open the door to let him come in. He would come up to everybody. He didn't even have to know you. He'll give you a hug, end quote. <laughs> I shall wear a crown. Taken from his community too soon. We thank God that he loaned Harry to this community for two years. And in two years, God has decided that his purpose was to bring us together. This trash can is where two-year-old Ezekiel Harry's body was found, now surrounded with teddy bears, balloons and a toy truck. The community holding on to each other for support as tears were shed for the little boy who never got the chance to show the world who he would be. This is our community, this is where we live. And for a tragedy to rock us like this, it's just absolutely devastating. If we don't come together, then how are we protecting our kids? So stop blaming others that wasn't there or didn't do this. Just be the village. I discovered that his name literally means God strengthens. The Terraboom Parish Courthouse steps were packed this evening, and every single person in attendance was there to remember two-year-old Ezekiel Harry. Ezekiel was amazing. He was smart, intelligent, and he didn't deserve it. He was very playful, like feisty, um, like he was friendly, like to play, playful, dancing. He was the life of the party, man. He was. That was our boy. Community leaders led the service with prayer and called for unity. State Senator Mike Feesey pledging to pursue Ezekiel's law to protect other kids from child abuse. In the state of Louisiana last year, we had 55 children die in this situation from the statistics I got. Already this year, in six months, which is half of the year, we're at 33, which is a 23% increase. I mean, I couldn't find out a lot about Ezekiel, what he liked, who he was, but I mean... He was two. He didn't even have enough time to become who he was supposed to be, who he was going to be if his life wasn't interrupted. All of that possibility, all of that future, it was stolen from him. And it is nice to see the community gathering together to honor Ezekiel. But I guess I'm just a little too bitter to see the light through the dark just yet. Because as the camera pans over all of those faces, all of those people who came out for Ezekiel, I just want to ask, like, where were all of you a few weeks ago? I know it may sound unfair. I'm trying to be fair here. But to see all the people who are there, they cared about him, they're sad he's gone, it's nice. But he needed someone then. He needed someone when he was trapped in a house with an abusive man and an abusive mother and three other little kids who were terrified every single day. 
He needed someone when he was held hostage by fear and violence, surrounded by neighbors, surrounded by a community with law enforcement and state-funded services that are intended to help children in his very same situation. So maybe in a few months, I'll let my heart soften enough to accept the hope that these images are intended to provoke, but not yet. It's too soon. And maybe Ezekiel's father felt the same way because he was not there at that memorial service. And we have a politician getting up there. We need to get Ezekiel's law going so we can protect other kids. But as of this date I'm recording this, I can't find any specifics about what Ezekiel's law would contain, how it would be formatted to protect other kids. Like, what is Ezekiel's law? He's just up there screaming, Ezekiel's law. What is Ezekiel's law? Let me see if, if anything's come out in the past couple of days. Yo, before I go on... So you know the person who, the redhead girl who was saying like, oh, he was the life of the party. That's Ezekiel's stepmother. So I assume she's married to Ezekiel's father, um, Trey Harry. Her last name's Goodry. And when I was just reading it, I was like, Goodry, I feel like I know that name. I do know that name. On Tuesday, September 8th, Jake Goodry of Thibodeau was arrested for killing his 11-month-old daughter, Zabria. Do you think they're related? Is is Ivy and Jake related? They have the same last name. They both live in Louisiana. That would be something, wouldn't it? That would be something. Okay, Ezekiel's Law. Let's see. No, it literally just says, like, State Senator Mike Fessy was at the vigil as well, pledging to pursue Ezekiel's Law. Okay, what is Ezekiel's Law? What is it? Okay, this, this article is from two days ago. It's a little bit more current. State Senator Big Mike course he has a name right why do all these freaking politicians that are of the people and always with the people why do they always have these weird nicknames like big mike it's always big too right like that's something i've noticed all of the politicians who are like i'm one of you i'm here i care about the things that you do like they're in the crowds it's very much tammany hall like you know they always got these nicknames big mike fessy Ugh. So he said he's still gathering information, but would like to put forward a bill dealing with some of the issues regarding how the state handles reports of child abuse. And it will be called Ezekiel's Law. Somebody else said, I think some investigation is needed on what procedures were followed, what procedures they had in place that wasn't followed. Are all of these procedures that you have in place inadequate? Clearly. Clearly. So I'm very interested to know what Big Mike's plan is and why it took so long for this to occur to him. I mean, this pattern in Louisiana has been going on for a while. This needed to happen for a while since it's clearly been an issue in Louisiana for quite some time. Like, where has state senator Big Mike Fesey been at? Or Fessy, whatever his name is. He's been in office since 2020. Man, it's 2022. We're closely coming up on 2023 here, all right? It's the end of July. August is around the corner. You know what happens right after August. September, fall. What happens after September? Winter, the end of the year, all right? I don't know. What are you doing, Mike? Big Mike. It really bugs me. <laughs> I'm sorry. So like I said, I know it sounds like, oh, Stephanie, you're blaming everybody. It's just the parents' fault. Um, it's, you know, Maya Jones's fault. Absolutely. 100 million percent agree with you. But there's more that people can do. And like I said, I lived in an apartment for a while. I had neighbors who were constantly screaming, kids constantly crying. I heard things being thrown. I called the police a bunch. They didn't do anything. So you know what I did? I I went over there myself. I walked right over. I knocked on the door. They answered. And I was like, hey, I'm your neighbor, Stephanie. Just so you know, um, if you guys need any help, like if you need help with babysitting, let me know. Like I hear you got kids over over here in your house. I hear them crying all the time. Actually, I hear everything over on my side. So just in case you guys needed anything, just in case you needed help, cup of sugar, you know, you want me to watch the kids while you run to the grocery store real quick, I got you. I'm here, you know? And they never took me up on it, not the sugar or the childcare. However, they knew I was there. They knew I heard. They knew somebody was paying attention. They also knew I was calling the police because I didn't make any reports anonymously. And I think it threw them that I was like knocking on their door and talking to them. They were like, what is this girl doing? Like, what's her deal? What's her like plan? What's her end game? My end game was to let you know that I know so that maybe you'll think twice before, you know, abusing your kids or abusing your wife or screaming at each other and swearing at each other while your kids watch and cry. Just something, you know, just do something. Let them know that you're there. And to be honest, from that moment I went over, I didn't hear anything else. They didn't move out or anything, but I didn't hear any more fighting. So maybe it was just the knowledge that somebody heard and that somebody knew what they were doing 
that stopped them. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe they were just quieter about it, like that one neighbor said. But you've got to do what you've got to do. And honestly, uh, shame is a great tactic. Abusive parents should be shamed. They should be. And I know that might sound harsh, but I, I don't know why it would, man. I don't know why it would. I'm not talking like parents who, you know, can't afford to like feed their kids should be shamed. I'm not talking parents who discipline their kids or put them in timeout or whatever should be shamed. I'm talking physical, emotional abuse. And you'll know the difference between regular discipline and actual abuse if you're a human being with a brain. And I think you all are. I know you all are. I don't know, guys. I don't know. Um. Like I said, maybe once some time has passed, I'll be a little bit more willing to accept the the message of hope and, you know, that Ezekiel died to bring everybody together. Maybe I'll be able to accept that. Probably not. But you have to understand when you're looking through these cases every single day and you see kid after kid after kid, kid dead, left in the car, kid found in, you know, parents' trunk, coroner says kid suffered abuse for two years, stuff like that. It just literally makes you so angry. And it makes me just want to, you know, gather up all the little kids and like just put a huge message out there. Like if you abuse your kid, if you don't want your kids, send them over, man. I'll get a big farm, you know, a couple thousand acres. We'll plant food. We'll raise chickens. Send all the, the unloved, unwanted kids to me because I will love them. I'll do my best, you know. Um, I wish that that was possible, honestly. But like I said, I don't know. I don't know anymore. Let me know what you think in the comment section. And if you see something, say something. You can report things anonymously. Personally, from what I found out during this video, it might be the best to give your name and just ask that it not be released to the people you're making a complaint against in case the police need to follow up. But... Let me know what you think in the comment section. Thank you guys so much for being here. I actually feel better now that I kind of vented and got it out to you guys. And um, now we can talk about it and discuss it and maybe, you know, even figure out a solution if there is one. There has to be, man. There has to be a solution. But let me know what you guys think. Don't forget to hit like if you liked this video. Don't forget to share it if you think it's worth sharing. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. So many of you watching not subscribed. Subscribe so that you get notified when I post a new video. Subscribe so you can be a part of this amazing and growing community because we have a very, very nice community here. We, for the most part, the, the people here in, in my community, in our community, are super kind and understanding and, and just beautiful, wonderful people. So hit subscribe, join the community. Join the conversation in the comment section. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Links are in the description box. Don't forget to check out HelloFresh. Link is in the description box. Don't forget to check out my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host with retired police detective Derek Lavasser every single week. Also, don't forget to check out my coffee company, Criminal Coffee Company. Really, really, really good coffee. I promise. I wouldn't lie to you. Thank you guys so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very, very soon. Straight down, and that river runs deep. The mountains get steep, and the voice is getting too loud. All these feelings I bury, it's looking like a cemetery. They're going back from the grave, calling out my name. Better say a Hail Mary. Well, you don't know how deep it goes until it's getting you slowly. And so, you got to let it go. I got blood, blood on the strings Sun house, the 